My name is Ed Finkler. Uh, I'm a web developer. I work for a company called Fictive Kin. Um, my website at Funkatron.com. You can talk to me on Twitter at Funkatron. Um, and this is a talk called Open Sourcing Mental Illness. Um, so a uh, quick little bit about myself, if you don't know me, which you probably don't. Um, I'm a dad, and I'm a husband, and I'm a developer type person, and I occasionally I write music, and I'm kind of a big nerd, which kind of seems like everybody here is like that, which is pretty cool, right? Um, wow, that's very loud, isn't it? I'm very <laughs> booming. Uh, okay. Uh, and I also have a mental illness, or some people may call it a mental disorder, or some people, lots of different names for that. Some people don't like the word mental illness. Or I really have a couple. I have a couple diagnoses. Um, now, I'm just here as a person. I am not a doctor. I am not a psychologist. I am not a psychiatrist. I have not been licensed in any kind of therapy. I do not have any formal education in that stuff. Um, I do have a certification in mental health first aid, um, but other than that, I don't have any uh, you know, formalized training in that regard. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, I'm just going to present kind of stuff that I've got and my personal experiences. Um, but I'm here to, to kind of talk about what it's like to have a mental illness uh, from my perspective, and also to talk a little bit about sort of the wider issues related to it, particularly in tech and particularly in workplace issues. Um, so I've been doing this talk now for about a year and a half. And uh, it sort of started off initially, it was just about, well, what my experiences have been. But I'm going to try to kind of move that a little bit in a direction of talking about what we can do about the culture and tech, and specifically about places um, that we work at uh, in order to change those kinds of things. So I wanted to do a little informal survey. Um, now, I'm curious, how many of you like need glasses or contacts or know somebody who does? Now, clearly. Most of you are not afraid of letting people know that, that you have some sort of visual indicator that's sitting on your face that you say, hey, I have you know, some kind of issue with my eyes, let's say an optic disorder, uh, and, and we deal with that. Now, are any of you afraid to tell people about that? No, I am, I am not. I don't think anybody here is. That's kind of obvious. Um, now, um, I, I, would people tell you, hey, you know, have you ever taken the, uh, you have to take your glasses off and like right now I can't see really anything. And have they ever said like, um, when you can't pass the test, you can't see these words up on the, or the letters on the thing, it's like E, F, G, L, qubit, quantum. Uh, and, and you say, does anybody ever ask you are, you, are you trying hard enough? Like, are you? <laughs> Maybe you should try harder to see that. Or if it, like, have, have you tried squinting? If you try squinting, that works for me if I can do better on that. But nobody does that. You know, everybody's kind of like, well, this is just normal. Everybody has this kind of stuff, right? And lots of people have issues with, like, they need their eyesight and they, have, they need some kind of assistive device or some kind of treatment to assist with their eyesight or things like that. Now, I'm curious about um, if any of you uh, have experienced somebody like you have somebody in your life who has experienced diabetes or you maybe deal with that yourself just I'm just curious if you raise your hand that's fine so lots of people um, my dad and my brother both have type 2 diabetes which probably makes it incredibly likely that I'll get it as well um, which is unfortunate because I really really like candy um, but uh, I are, are any of us like are we kind of nervous about telling people that like nervous about talking about. I'm just curious, would most people feel kind of okay? And like you wouldn't bring it up as like, hey, nice to meet you. You know, by the way, I have diabetes. Or, you know, you might not do that. You might not say, oh, you know, my brother has diabetes, my sister has diabetes, or something like that. So it's probably okay, but it's not like, it might not be the most comfortable thing in the world. It might be bring it up in appropriate, appropriate times. Um, now, something is, uh, I, think it's, I think this has changed a little recently. Um, I have a brother who has cancer. I don't mind telling people that. And I think most of us have gotten comfortable with the notion that people get cancer, and that happens, and that really fucking sucks. But it's not something we should be afraid to talk about. And in fact, being afraid to talk about it is actually incredibly detrimental because it means that you're far more likely to not catch it early on because you're afraid to get tested because you don't want to talk about it. Now, I'm curious how many of you are like, I would never talk about cancer, you know, like I didn't you know, bring it up. Any of you would be like, nah, I'm not going to talk about that. So, you know, most of us are probably fairly comfortable. Not a fun subject, not something we bring up, you know, at a fun party or anything like that. But um, now you don't have to say you have one. But how many of you would feel comfortable talking to uh, 
if you don't have a boss, let's assume you do have a boss uh, or a manager or something like that, would be talking about a mental health issue. I was curious how many, raise your hands if you'd be comfortable talking about that. So most, I would, most know at best, eh, maybe, <laughs> right? Um, now what about like a colleague, somebody who was kind of on your level who did not have some kind of power to let you down, and, you know, it would, how many of you would feel comfortable with, like a colleague you feel kind of comfortable with? We're talking about more of you would kind of be talking about that. But the level, you know, or how about a friend or a family member bringing that up? So, so more people are willing to talk about that. Now up here, there's cancer that kills a ton of people and it's a very serious issue. And over here, there's mental health disorders that kills less people, but actually causes more, pro like in terms of like it's, I'll get into this, but what we calculate is the, the burden of disease which calculates both the level of death and the, uh, the years lost due to disability from the disorder, which is actually higher for mental disorders. We don't want to talk about it. And we have the same kinds of issues with that as, you know, we're cool with cancer, but something that actually is a more serious problem in terms of maybe less people die from it, but more people suffer from it and lose time in their lives from it. We don't want to talk about it. And that's kind of what I'm getting at in terms of stigma issues and things like that. Um, talk a little bit about kind of how this affects us and how this affects us as a, you know, I'm going to talk about North America and the U.S. because I know about North America and the U.S. and those are the stats that I looked up and that was easy to do. Um, it is going to vary, but I think that what you saw, at least from what I've seen, is that in most, um, let's say, European and other industrialized nations, there are lots of, they're pretty similar in terms of how they lay out. And, and, and how uh, mental disorders show up, the percentage that they show up, and things like that. Well, one in five, one in five adults have a mental disorder in any one year in the US. They're dealing with a mental disorder. So 20% of the population in the US is dealing with it any given year. That's an enormous number. That's a huge number of people. By far, the most common are anxiety disorders, um, and I think depression is after that. Um, if we look at it in terms of level of disability, um, so if, to give you an idea, because a lot of times people don't have an, under, they have an understanding of like what the disability would be for what they call physical illnesses, and they don't have an idea of what the level of disability is for what they describe are mental illnesses. So um, moderate depression has a level of disability that's similar to multiple sclerosis or severe asthma. So it has the same sort of impact on somebody's life in terms of taking away their ability to be productive, to be happy, to do things, stuff like that. Now, severe depression, severe depression being things where you're having, having severe motor retardation, you're sleeping all the time, you're having you know, just very severe stuff, is similar to quadriplegia. In fact, your ability to move around, the, the amount of time that it takes away from you, the amount of time it takes away from your ability to live a, what we would call sort of a normal productive life in society. Um, and again, that's in measuring that global burden of disease, and that's that burden of basically how many like, days out of the year does it take out of that and measure that up in terms of years. The burden is similar on those kinds of levels. So disease burden, that's again, that's premature death plus those levels lived with disability. Now the burden of mental disorders, just mental disorders, is the largest of all the disorder categories in North America. It's larger than cardiovascular disease, and it's larger than cancer and everything else. Everything else is higher than that. Now, the level of premature death is lower, but the level of years lived with disability and the uh, impact that it has, that those, those days it takes out of your year, those, that it takes out of every person's year that was dealing with a mental disorder, is far, far higher, far higher. This is a quote from the World Health Organization on a report, Global Burden of Disease in 2004, where I got a lot of this stuff from. It says, in all regions, neuropsychiatric conditions are the most important causes of disability, accounting for one third of years lost to disability among adults age 15 and over. So we can kind of think about that, and something we might think about is first quality of life, obviously. But we can also think about it because a lot of times we work these tech jobs and these tech jobs maybe, you know, like, like most businesses, we work in a business and they're interested in productivity and stuff like that. Well, these, this group of diseases, this group of disorders has a severe impact on the productivity of workers. 
um, a severe impact on their ability to be productive on some level. And um, it is the single biggest cause of that disability, above anything else. But how much do we talk, how willing are we to talk about that? How are we addressing that? I don't think we are, based on sort of how we feel culturally about it. So one of the things that I try to do is talk about this stuff openly and talk about the things that I deal with um, and what my diagnoses are. And the major one that I deal with is generalized anxiety disorder. Um, I have depression as a part of that. Um, and so I was, when I was younger, it was primarily depression, but it's kind of hard. A lot of these times these things are intermixed and you have what they call comorbidity, um, where you're diagnosed with multiple things, like you have depression and anxiety, and lots of people have depression and anxiety, or you have something else, like you have a psychosis and you have a substance abuse problem, or things like that. So a lot of mental, uh, I mean, a lot of mental disorders, oftentimes you'll see that comorbidity level. Um, so I have depression as a part of that, but really my primary thing is I have generalized anxiety disorder. Um, uh, I have adult ADD, which is something I had dealt with for a while. I wasn't diagnosed until I was 27. I was quite convinced I had both childhood and teenager ADD. I don't know if teenager ADD is a thing. <laughs> but um, uh, I was one of these kids who did really well. Uh, I was able to get by, and I did well enough in high school. Like I did okay, but I never completed all my homework. I went to this private school that had a bunch of reading. It's like, read 150 pages of Dostoevsky, and I would read like 25, um, and things like that. And so in my class, I had like the third lowest GPA, but strangely, I had like the third highest SAT score in the class. Um, I don't know why, that was sort of the nature of it. I had trouble sort of balancing those different schedules. Probably if I had been diagnosed, uh, and I don't know, there was sort of, maybe there was less of that in 1991 or wherever I was in high school. That was, uh, that was something that I dealt with and still deal with. Um, now I take some medications that go along with that that help treat a number of these different things. Uh, I take Lexapro, which is a really common SSRI, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, it is one of the newest versions of a bunch of SSRIs that goes back to Prozac, and Prozac was the first one that was on the market. Um, People think that serotonin has something to do with how we, uh, well, let's just say be happier. Um, and one of the things you'll find is when you look at the like, descriptions of how these medications work, they'll say, I don't know, it kind of seems like it does this and it doesn't kill people. <laughs> so, okay. And that's what, you know, um, if you, uh, it's interesting how our understanding of how a lot of, the, a lot of these processes work because of these, these, these processes, of, particularly when it comes to biological processes that impact mental disorders, our understanding of it is very limited. We do not have a clear understanding the same way we might have a clearer understanding of, say, cardiovascular disease or things like that because we don't have the understanding of the interaction between psychology and, um, and the pure physical stuff that's going on. Um, so I also take Boost Bar, and Boost Bar is an anti-anxiety medication. It also seems to, and I swear to God, this is in the description of it, it seems to help with the, uh, way th with the uh, effectiveness of SSRI. So if you take an SSRI and you also take Boost Bar, it seems like the SSRI works better. They don't really know why, it just does. So, um, and I also take Stratera, and Stratera is a medication for ADD. It is, I think, at least in the US, the only medication that I know of that is not an amphetamine. Um, and it's kind of kind of not advisable if you have an anxiety disorder to take um, speed, but um, <laughs> so that's why I take Stratera as opposed to something like Adderall or something like that, one of those common things. Um, I did take Adderall for a little bit and it was, it makes you feel super awesome for a while, like the first five days, and then you take the same, but you take the same dosage all the time, of course you get used to it, and then it just made me angry and pissed off all the time. Um, but at first it was like I talked really fast and I didn't eat anything and I felt awesome, kind of. So it was actually pretty fun. But, um, but uh, it has bad effects. You do not want to just take it for any reason. Um, so I take Shotera. Now, of course, my, my, uh, I'm lucky that I can afford it. Of course, my medication decided that, uh, what, or my insurance said, you know what, we're going to drop that down into like a lower tier priority about how much we're going to pay for that. So now instead of paying like 40 bucks, because there's no generic for Sotera, now instead of paying like 40 bucks a month, you're going to pay about $95 a month for it. So I'm paying like $9,500 a month for 30 pills for that thing, which is actually kind of cheap because if I didn't have insurance, it would be like 600 or something like that. Um, and no, there's no generic. 
And yes, they gave me a list of the medications that I could take instead, and all of them are amphetamines. So that, you know, fuck those guys. Um, but anyway, uh, and then clonopin. I take clonopin. It is a it is a tranquilizer, a, a benzo that is is kind of like Xanax or something like that. If you've taken it. Um, and I take kind of a maintenance dose of that, and it helps me with stuff. And eventually, what has been over the years, over many years, I've just kind of found this combination of stuff, and it works pretty well, and it helps me not be as badly stressed out. Uh, and th that's medication I take. I, you know, I, there's also I do therapy and stuff like that, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, which is really common for people who are dealing with anxiety disorders and things like that. So dealing with that kind of stuff. Um, but that, those are medications that I take. So. This next thing is kind of talking about what it's like, and this is really what it's like for me. What I found is that for some people it's similar. Um, now, uh, I'm just gonna tell you what it feels like for me. I'm not gonna tell you what it's like for you, and that's a big mistake I think a lot of people make, because they think, well, it's like, we're kind of similar, so, and then they get into a thing where they tell you how to fix your problems, and that's kind of not cool. So I'm really not gonna do that, but the biggest thing I have is anxiety, and that's, a huge thing. I'm like, strength, for one reason or another, I was super anxious about giving this talk. Now I've given this talk, this is a slightly different version. I keep changing it and adding stuff to it and things like that. But I uh, was actually really anxious about giving it here for a bunch of different reasons. But um, uh, none of them seem like they would actually kind of make sense in the, in the idea that if I measure like, okay, what is the actual thing going on? I think about it logically and I think about the kind of reaction that I'm having those things are disparate. And that's, I guess, the, the nature of why it's an anxiety disorder is because um, it's sort of the level that I'm having and the way that it interferes with my day-to-day -day life, my ability to be happy, my ability to be productive, to have good relationships and things like that. So, the, uh, so you know, I, for me, it's, it's a matter of like, I, there's, Stuff that you'll have that kind of makes you anxious. And there's certain things that are sort of common, like, oh, wait, I'm buying or I'm selling a house. That's stuff that kind of makes you anxious, right? And that's stuff that most people have to deal with, and it's stressful and that kind of thing. And that's, that's the thing that's common. And it's common to have some stress with it. Well, um, the problem is that I have like these high levels of, of anxiety responses to things that either don't, don't warrant that. Like, our bodies, you know, if, if well, let's believe evolution for a second. Um, and if we make that assumption that that is correct, there is this idea that um, you ha there, anxiety is simply, it's just a stress response in your body. And that's a measurable thing. You can see you know, people who are having anxiety or going through anxiety or describing themselves stuff or going through a lot of stress. Their bodies are pumped full of cortisol. Um, there, uh, there are lots of different, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what, I'm a great doctor. I'd make an excellent doctor. <laughs> I don't know, there's a bunch of stuff happening to your body. It's like, these things happen. I don't know, you're just stressed out. It's, it's just stuff, you know. Um, anyway, but uh, there's, there's different, I keep thinking of the word pheromones and that's not the right thing, but there's different. <laughs> So there's different hormones going through your body and stuff like that. Cortisol is the most common one. You see cortisol in almost all of your stress responses. Your body starts pumping through cortisol. And so um, it, it, that's a normal reaction that you should have um, it, it, when, if you're, that you go through. Uh, and depression is the same kind of thing. Depression is also a stress response. Um, depression is a stress response where your body kind of shuts down. And that you might have that. And that, that's similar to what we observe um, with things like animals who are hurt stuff like that. So if you get bitten by a lion, you may have this kind of response. Let's say I'm getting chased by a lion, I would have a fight or flight reaction. And that is a common thing that I have. Now, so that's appropriate. If a lion is chasing me, I should have that kind of reaction. I should have an, oh fuck, I need to do something reaction. The problem is like if I have that reaction because um, I got an email from somebody who I am slightly uncomfortable with or I don't really like. And I have that reaction, like I get really fucking pissed off, right, or something like that. And for me, you know, and this is one of the things that works with my therapist is that almost all of my anger and frustration, it all comes from fear. All of it is fear. It, I'm scared of stuff. I'm scared of things going wrong. I, I dislike being in new places. I dislike being in new situations that I don't feel comfortable with, that I don't know what, how, to, how to handle it. I feel like I value uh, sameness very much. I, I value stability very much. And um, 
that's a that's a strong thing for me. It's and I, yeah, and I have physical manifestations of that to some extent. For me, uh, you know, it's changed over the years. I used to get these big knots like right under the sternum. Um, now I tend to I'll get like nauseous. Uh, I'll start sweating and just kind of be jumpy and stuff like that. And feel I'll. I'll feel that kind of stuff going on. Uh, I used to have IBS, which people don't know is irritable bowel syndrome, so basically I felt like I was gonna shit my pants all the time. Um, and uh, that super sucked. Um, and that was, I mean, that was so bad that I didn't wanna leave like the room. I didn't wanna go like five minutes away from a bathroom at any given time. So which sort of makes travel challenging. Um, so I basically didn't travel anywhere for like five or six years. I just didn't go anywhere. Um, I'm scared to go to new places. I'm scared to things like, like uh, public transportation, I am scared to death of it because I don't understand it and I don't know what I'm gonna do and I feel like I get on the bus and if I don't know exactly what to do, I'm gonna embarrass myself. So what, do I give you this ticket? Do, what if I don't have exact change? I don't know what's gonna happen. And I'll just be like, I'm out, right? And I won't do it. I'll just be like, I know how taxis work so I'll just charge that. So instead of going like a 250 bus fare, I'll be like, hey, I'll just do this $40 taxi but because it is way less stressful for me. Um, a lot of this stuff for me, I, like a lot of times it feels like the, the emotions are really intense and I can't kind of shut them off. Like if I have a reaction that's thrown me into something where, like especially if it's an, like an anger reaction or something like that, it really, it feels like it's kind of like a big wave and I have to kind of ride it out. And that's something that's challenging for me and one of these things I'm trying to work with with my therapist and stuff like that is figuring out how to sort of disrupt that. But it's very, very hard to um, because it feels like like uh, you triggered something in your brain and it's like it has to run itself out. And until it run itself out, I'm gonna be a massive dickhead. That is just it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, like I have to leave the room and I'm not gonna say anything and I'm not gonna do that because if I say anything to the people I, to anyone, let alone the people I give, care about the most, I will probably say the worst things to the people I care about the most and people who are just around, you know, I, I, I'll say horrible things. And it's, it's horribly embarrassing and it's, it's, it's it's awful. It's awful that feeling that you feel like you really can't control what you're going to say and you don't have control over your emotions. That's deeply unsettling. Um, and it can make your best friends seem like enemies. Oftentimes it feels like the, the people that I care about the most, it like flips it and I just get so fucking mad at them for some reason, which is, and if I think about it, even I know logically this makes no sense, the, the problem is that that's how I feel and I can't make myself not feel that way. And it's really, really hard because I try to assess things logically, but my brain is literally is just screaming at me with something else. Um, and it can make everything that you enjoy, everything that you, you know normally, it can seem useless and empty just because of this mood change. Just, I mean, things that I enjoy regularly, that, it, it, that it's, I'm in a different place and it just doesn't, it doesn't add up anymore. This stuff you know, that I enjoy, doesn't, I, I don't like it anymore. It seems worthless and it seems useless. Um, you know, I talked about I have, Adult ADD, I have problems focusing. So Terra seems to help with that. Um, but it's obviously a productivity thing and a lot of people kind of suffer from that. I think to some extent, um, many of us suffer from that, a little bit of that because of the way that we have sort of like our like reward response that happens when we see a little piece of information like on the internet and we grab that little piece of information that gives us something and then we scroll a little bit more and we get another piece of information and we click on this thing and it gives us another piece of information and stuff like that. And so there's this strong, uh, like a uh, sort of response, like reward thing that we have, action response reward, all that stuff. Um, but I, I, for me, it would be like, I would just not focus on stuff I really should be doing. I would have real trouble with that. Now it's like, I might have a day that's bad with that, but it used to be like before I was taking medication, before I worked on that stuff more. And I think some of that changes as you get older a little bit too. Um, it would be like, I'd have a week or two weeks like that where I'm just not productive at all, right? Um, I have a lot of issues, and again, this is kind of better with medication and better with the therapy that I've been going through and stuff like that, cognitive behavior therapy, but I have these spiraling chains of thoughts. Um, and it's particularly easy for me to construct negative outcomes easily, so that like, if I find out, like I get a, a note, like on, say Friday night, that, say, that you know, my boss says, hey, let's talk about something on Monday morning. I will assume that we're going to be homeless next week. My family is going to be thrown out of their home. Um, that nothing's going to happen. And, and obviously what he means is that he's, I'm getting fired. That's obviously that's what's going to happen. And it never is. Or well, sometimes it is kind of serious. But it's, it has not yet happened that that was like the biggest thing. Um, 
And it's, it, that's a pretty common thing for me, um, is that I have these kind of spiraling chain of thoughts where I construct negative outcomes from like one thing and it goes to, I can immediately go to like, okay, this, 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 we're all dead. And uh, this is really easy for me to do. Um, I tend to obsess on negative events and I obsess on negative events in the past. And one of the things I talk about with my therapist is that I spend a lot of time in the future and I spend a lot of time in the past and I spend very little time in the present. And it is very hard to be relaxed when you're always thinking about the future and you're always thinking about the past. And it is very hard not to be relaxed if you're focused on the present. Now, it's something you have to practice, for my, at least in my case, I have to practice that really, really hard. Because otherwise what I do is I spend all my time thinking about it. All, I'm never there. I'm never, like they say, present. I'm never in that present. I'm never just thinking about what's going on right now. Um, conflict is really upsetting for me. Um, and I tend to tend to be a person who sort of, like I tend to be one of these people who if I feel like there's something is being, like somebody's being treated inappropriately, or if something is going wrong, or they're, you know, uh, they're kind of catching some shit for not a good reason, um, that really bothers me. And I feel like somebody needs to say something about that, and oftentimes I feel like I should be the one to say it. At the same time, the conflict is really, really upsetting for me. I get into, uh, let's say, we, Twitter is the best medium in the world for misunderstandings and hating each other. And, um, and I'm really good about that. Um, I let myself get extremely wrapped up in it and extremely emotional and take things incredibly personally, internalize everything. Even things long in the past that I've had to deal with. I have a lot of trouble letting go of pain or hurt from the past. Um, uh, and sometimes even just seeing like somebody that, something that reminds me of a particular person. Like um, an organization maybe they were once affiliated with. Or just seeing their name like in my Twitter stream can set me off in a bad way and make me really uncomfortable. Um, and the thing is that really sucks about that is I know very well that this person, I don't know, maybe they think about me, maybe, but probably they don't, and there's no reason I should feel this way because it serves no purpose whatsoever, but I can't fucking let go of it. And it's really, really hard. That just really sucks. Um, and if you combine all that stuff together, uh, I think the thing that gets really hard is that you feel alone and you feel unlike anyone else. And that's really, really, at the, at the end of it, that's, I think, the hardest stuff. That's the stuff that's most crushingly difficult, is this idea that you are not like anybody else and that you are isolated. Even if you're in a room with, like, 100 other people, you are alone. And that's really hard. And I've often felt in my life um, that there's just something wrong with me and I'm broken and I'm never going to be right. I'm just never going to be right. I'm never going to be able to be productive in society. If I could, you know, I think it could go so much better if I would just get my shit together and my brain would just work the way it's supposed to work and things like that. But it just never does. And I don't know how to make it do that. And I felt that way a lot. And that I've dealt with issues like suicidal thoughts, self-mutilation, and things like that. Um, I still have scars on my arms from doing stuff like that, um, from uh, self-mutilation stuff, which is very different than suicidal actions. Um, uh, but... I, uh, and I've only approached, you know, considered suicide a couple times. Uh, I've never tried to complete that. But, um, you know, recent, like in the past few months, extreme stress that I've had, extreme stress in relationship stuff or other kinds of things that goes on, it brought on this ideation of suicide. Um, that I start thinking about it, that I start processing that. Because it's like, I don't know what else to do. It's like, you feel like you're just fucked up and there's no way to fix it. And that really, really sucks. And fuck, man, that's really hard. Um, and it's rough, and it's demoralizing, and it's hard, and you feel like you're alone, and you're, it's never going to get better, and it's never going to get fixed. And that is really demoralizing to think about. Um, but the key thing is that we can't be silent about this stuff. And I know that me talking about this has made it easier for me to deal with my own issues. And I think that, based on the responses I've gotten from giving these kinds of talks, is that the fact that we can talk about this openly makes it just a little bit less scary. Um, and I think the problem is that we just, we, if we're silent about this stuff, it doesn't get fixed. If we're scared to talk about it, as scary as it is, if we let that fear control us and that we don't talk about it, it's not going to get fixed. And I compare it a little bit to what ACT UP New York did in the 1980s uh, with their sign, silence equals death, dealing with the AIDS crisis in the 80s, where nobody was listening to those folks. Now, it's not, it's not, I'm not going to compare and say, oh, this is just, you know, 
There was maybe more maliciousness uh, related to ignoring H the issues of HIV in the 80s, and um, maybe their intent the government was intentionally ignoring that in the US. I don't know. Um, and they're not exactly the same thing, though. So the morbidity level uh, of, of HIV and AIDS at that time was far, far higher than you have in mental disorders. But I think there's a lot of similarities there, too. That if we decide that we're not going to talk about it, what happens is that people suffer and people die because of this, because they don't seek out treatment, because they're scared to do it. And ultimately, that's what I want to change. So as a developer, what is this kind? Of, what is this like for me? I, you know, as a, um, it's interesting. There's actually some sort of positive things about this. Um, I'm actually really good at like kind of quickly pattern matching, and I think a lot of that comes with my ability to construct outcomes really quickly and usually bad ones. So um, I'm pretty good at like taking patterns to solve problems. I'm not necessarily the original idea person. I'm not good at like coming up with awesome products and shit like that. But I'm usually good at solving problems for people, especially if there's like, oh, well, there's a solution here that I saw. So we can take that and now we can apply this over here and I can do something like that. And I'm really pretty good at that. Um, I'm good at anticipating potential outcomes quickly. So like if you give me something and I look at a piece of code, I can say, Oh, you know what? I wonder, well, if you do this and you just you don't do this to the input, it's really easy for that to be escaped out and that's potential exploit and stuff like that. So I'm pretty good at identifying sort of like simple security vulnerability vectors like that. Um, I think I'm pretty good at being an empathetic and supportive colleague because I've dealt with a lot of this shit. Um, and I get a lot of reward out of helping others and that's really cool. And I think that, um, I think practicing empathy and, and oftentimes feeling, I think when you feel alone, you realize the importance of empathy really strongly, maybe stronger than others do. And um, so I think I have a lot of empathy for users who ultimately most of the things that we build are used by, you know, like normal humans and not mentats like us. So, the, uh, so <laughs> having empathy for users and for other, the people that you're building your products for, things like that, that's incredibly important as a, as a web developer is what I do. And I think most of the tools that we build, people are going to use them. So we need to understand what it's like for those people. Right? We need to be able to put our shoes, our, 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 put ourselves in their shoes, right? Um, I have, uh, you know, working with teams is sometimes a hard thing for me. Uh, I do a lot of remote work. I work remotely for the group that I have now. We're spread all over the world. Um, I have to kind of be careful about not working alone for a long period. Sometimes it kind of gets dark <laughs> uh, when I do that. I also, but I don't like working around necessarily a bunch of people. Like, I've been in some offices where it's just like, hey, let's shove 200 people into one room. And I'm like... It's deeply uncomfortable for me to be in that kind of a situation. I sort of like need to be able to hide away sometimes, and sometimes I'm okay with like you know we have a, I work at a co-working space usually, and it's a shared space, and it's kind of fine. But I also sometimes need to be on my own, and it just varies, and I have to be careful. Like oh, no, leave the house. That's why I go to a co-working space. I could certainly work at home, but I leave the house because it, I find it is better for me mentally to do that. I feel like uh, I am less likely to get in a dark place with that. Um, but some of the things that are interesting about this as developers, um, I, I've heard, had this question brought up to me a number of times, and I don't have a good solution for it yet. But one of the big issues is, is like, do we bring up, uh, say, a mental health issue that we're dealing with in an interview? But we might be okay building up, so like, say, I, uh, I have to walk with a cane, or I have, you know, I have diabetes, or something like that, or I have some other issue that. It does not interfere with my ability to do my job, but there might be certain considerations that also have legal protection uh, that you have to deal with. And it is against the law to, uh, to discriminate against somebody for this kind of thing, but it's almost impossible to enforce that. Um, I mean, they could just find something like, oh, well, you're not a good culture fit, <laughs> you know, or some horse shit like that that they'll shove at you. Um, but a lot of people are scared to bring that up. Um, I think most people wouldn't. Now, my last, last job interview I did, I did bring it up. I don't think that's why I didn't get the job, but that's a thing. Um, dealing with managers and bosses, it's, that's a, uh, can be a hard thing. And I've been lucky that I've had, for the most part, people who I work with, supervisory roles or things like that, who um, were understanding of me. And after I kind of worked with them for a while, they understood what was going on and what worked well for me and what didn't work well for me. But having people who understand who are understanding of, uh, practice empathy towards me, are understanding and accommodating for me, that changes my quality of life dramatically. The amount of fear that I have about my workplace and whether I'm, something's gonna, bad's gonna happen or whether I'm gonna fuck up and, and like it's gonna be a terrible thing. Or like say, 
Uh, no, I don't want to go on the company retreat to go kayaking because that sounds like a fucking nightmare to me. Now, lots of people, they're always like, hey, let's go white water rafting. Show. No, I don't want to do that. That sounds terrible. Why would I want to do that? Now, some people will enjoy that. That's great. That is awesome. But this idea where it's like, well, everybody's got to go or you're kind of the asshole who didn't, you know, um, uh, people who don't understand that are not empathetic to that, not empathetic to people who that is uncomfortable for. Um, that makes it really, really hard because you're going to be constantly put in difficult situations. They're going to and they may or may not intend to do it. But the fact is that if you don't practice that, it's really, really hard. So talking about sort of trying to make your workplace safe, and this is one of these new things that I've, I've started talking about. And a lot of this comes from this mental health first aid stuff. So this is the workbook that I got, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, there's a basic thing that, like, at the end of the day, there's a fundamental thing, is that sick workers don't work. And if you're dealing with a mental health uh, issue uh, uh, that's impacting your ability to, say, come into work, or be productive at work or things like that, you are sick and you're not able to be productive. So if you don't treat people and you don't help them get through their problems, they're not going to get better. Now I worked there, used to work at Purdue University and I worked there for about nine years and they had tons of shit that was like, hey, you know what would be great is if everybody took a, take, let's take the stairs instead, right? You know, you walk around and you get, everybody's gonna take the stairs and you know, you don't need to take the elevator and let's make sure, let's do a bunch of stuff that sort of gets you excited about eating healthy foods and shit like that. And you know why they're doing that is because it costs them fucking money to treat all these people and they want to be more productive, they want them to be more productive because they want them to be in the office and they want them to be working and they want them to be happy and they want them to you know be healthy and they don't want their uh, medical expenses to be very high but they don't ever talk about mental disorders they never talked about mental disorders they talked a little bit about substance abuse I think back they did talk about substance abuse disorders which is in part of that spectrum but they didn't talk about anything else on that kind of a level and mental disorders have more impact than any of the other things they're dealing with but they're not talking about it. Sick workers don't work. And if you have a mental health disorder, you are sick. You are not bummed out. You are not lazy. You are not just having a bad day. You are having a health problem. That's what's going on. And anybody who tells you otherwise is full of shit and doesn't know what they're talking about. 41% of the people in the US with a mental health disorder in a given year have received professional help for it, 41%. I mean, it's less than half of the people who are dealing with this have actually got, been able to go and seek help. Now, there's a lot of different reasons for that, but that means that, what, oh, let's see math here. Three-fifths of people are not getting treatment in any given year for what they're dealing with, not any kind of professional help. Eight years, half the people who seek help for depression wait eight years or more to get help for it. Eight years. That means they are suffering with it for eight years. Their productivity is shot, their quality of life is screwed up. They think that they're fucked up and trying to figure out why they're lazy and why they're bummed out and why they can't get up, they don't feel like getting up in the morning and shit like that. Eight years it takes them to get help. And the longer it's delayed, the more difficult recovery can be. And what it's shown is that peers help, and they make a difference. People with mental health problems are more likely to seek help if someone close to them suggests it. So if we're not talking about it, if we're not learning how to help these people, if we're not suggesting them, if we're not giving them resources to go and seek help, we're not doing all we can to change this problem. And that eight years is a direct correlation between our inability to talk about this and these people suffering for no reason. They can get help. Help is available. Sometimes it's hard to figure out. Sometimes you live in rural areas, it's hard to find the help that you need. In a place like Portland, there are fucking resources all over the place. I live in a town that's got 100,000 people. There are plenty, plenty of resources. Most people don't get them because we don't talk about it, because we don't prioritize it. When was the last time, how many of you work in a workplace? Like you're not just, you're not an entrepreneur, you work in a workplace. How many of you? Raise your hands. When was the last time somebody brought up what uh, resources were available to you for mental health disorders? Can any of you remember it happening once? 
Last weekend? Last week. Right, good. I'm glad you work there. <laughs> I'm glad you, you are lucky. Because what we can see is most people, they never even talk about it. And that's the thing that's impacting their productivity as a business the most. Why aren't we talking about this? The biggest thing I think that we can do to change the situation and make our workplace culture a, a safe one to talk about this is to take a program called Mental Health First Aid. I feel very, very strongly about this program. I just got certified myself uh, last month in it. Um, and I've been dealing with mental health stuff since, I, I guess actively since I was 12 years old. I was hospitalized when I was 13 for two months. I've been on medication essentially ever since. I've been in uh, therapy. I've been dealing with this. This is a lifelong issue for me. And I learned a shitload that I didn't know before about how to help people. There are tons of things that I realized that I was doing wrong in terms of helping people that I needed to do differently. It cost me $50 to do this. And in a lot of cases in workplaces, if they'll come out and do training, they will do it cheaper. And the, the cost varies, most of it is just materials. Um, but uh, the, at least the cost in the US is well under $100. Did you have a question? Go ahead. Yep. So how important is it that you think, for me, like it's a big thing, I mean, human resources is supposed to be human resources. Now, I know that I'm constantly being told in this country that human resources, <laughs> just seeing you in America, that human resources is better to protect the company and the manager and not the worker. It often works out that way, yeah. But, um, I mean, I, but that wasn't always my interpretation of human resources. So how important is it, like, it's this cheap and it's that easy to do these courses, how important is it that these people Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So the key thing is that I feel like if you're in any kind of managerial or supervisory role, you're doing a disservice if, you're not, if you haven't taken this course. Because this course actively teaches you how to listen empathetically. You go through scenarios and work through this. You learn what works, you learn what doesn't, you learn what to say, you learn what not to say. And it's actually pretty easy to do it, and I learned a ton from it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, it's a really good question. I mean, that's why I keep bringing up productivity issues. Because if they're not dealing with it, there's massive lost productivity. And at the end of the day, um, we can talk about how important quality of life is, and some people will respond to that, things like that. But ultimately, if you say you're losing money because you're not treating these health issues, um, and because your culture doesn't make it easy for people to seek help and get the help that they need, and uh, feel comfortable in their situation, then they are actively hurting their bottom line because their, pro their workers won't be as productive. Ultimately, I think that is the thing that's going to be most effective at getting people into it. Because as organizations grow, and as organizations become, say, public, you go from private to public and things like that, essentially it's a bottom line issue. Productivity increases if you have a place where people are not sick as much. And if you're dealing with mental health disorder, you're sick. Yeah, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. For some issues that are in the mental health category, like OCD yes. and anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. especially in this economy, a lot of companies, my guess is, aren't going to want to deal with it unless a judge tells them to. Mm -hmm. Like, I fought my unemployment claim against the, the Rose Garden and said, mm -hmm. I can't work every available hour because of this. Yep. And I've won that, but otherwise, they're just going to say, well, we'll just get somebody else because there's plenty of other people who want a job. And a lot of times, Sure. So I know what you're saying about the bottom line, but I think a lot of companies just don't want to deal with it. 
Well, you're going to run into companies that don't want to deal with it unless it's enforced on a legal level. I think that um, there's a couple, you have to figure out how you choose to approach that on your own. Um, you may choose to pursue it. You may choose to not uh, pursue it. Uh, and you don't want to work there anymore. Uh, that's what you have to do. But I think at the end of the day, what you want to do is you want to talk to those kind of folks, uh, their managers and things like that. How many of you here work in a supervisory role or managerial role or things like that? Okay. Well, you in the back. I'll pay for you to take this course. Oh, well, if you quit, then it's no good. I'll still pay for you to take this. Okay, that's fine. The point is, I think this is really, really important, and it helps everybody, but I think it would be particularly helpful for organizations where you feel they're going to be open-minded to this. You need to start bringing it up. This is an easy thing to do. Organizations are around, instructors are around to come in and teach, say, all the managers, all the HR folks, all the things like that. And it will, they will understand how to deal with this stuff better. Yeah, what are you going to say? Yep, right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had my own self bounce impression that I was working at my last job. Sure. But on an improvement plan, it came out of it still, mm -hmm. you know, and we don't talk about this kind of stuff either. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, seeing what we are seeing, it was just like, it isn't as endemic as you say. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about it, I think it's really important to, when we make it something we talk about, that we're, that we're aware of the other intersectional aspects of this, which mm -hmm. is to say it's really easy, like it's going to be a lot easier for white guys like you and me yep. to stand up and say, man, I'm sick and I'm like, I've got some problems and people will make excuses and they'll yep. go, oh, yeah, he needs some time to recover. Whereas, uh, you know, a woman, uh, a person of color, a woman yep. of color, like, any, like anytime you, you show up any emotion, it's like, oh, you're angry, you're crazy. Yeah. You know, you're emotional. Right, right. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I think that's absolutely the case. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. At the end of the day, I think it, it gets into a larger life philosophy, but I think the point is empathy on all levels. I, we're kind of running out of time. I want to give this, and we can keep talking about this after, but I don't want to, if this, yeah, go ahead. I would say it comes up, yes. I think it might vary on the instructor. Um, but uh, it, the workbook does talk about how it applies to different different groups. Yes, um, I'm not necessarily. I guess I'm acting as a salesperson, but I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions about it. But I do know that it, I think it, it did deal with that to some extent. Um, yeah. So uh, the key thing here is I want to say is that I really need your help with this. And I need you to talk, and I need you to share, and I need you to spend time learning, like I'm trying to do. Um, so talk about it, email about it, tweet about it, post about it, do all of those things, and do it now, please. Um, it, anything that I've shown here, any of these URLs or any of these messages or any of these words, if they rang true with you, if they felt like they'd make a difference, um, please just talk about it. And thanks for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs>